Welcome to another event in the Channel Islands Maritime Museum Speaker Series. Tonight we're pleased to welcome Dr. Kathleen Ruse, teacher and environmental scientist, as our featured speaker. Dr. Ruse's experience as a scientist spans the globe, from our central coast to Russia, Iraq, Thailand, Nepal, Iceland, the Pacific Islands, and Antarctica. And tonight she will uncover some of the mysteries of Antarctica for us. Dr. Roos? Thank you, Terry. All right, hi, I'm Kathleen Roos. Welcome and thank you for coming. I'm going to talk about mysterious Antarctica and I'm going to talk about the diversity, actually the biodiversity of this frozen world. Antarctica is surrounded by three different oceans. Actually, it's all one ocean. You have the southern, it's the southern ocean made up of the southern Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and the southern Atlantic. All right. You usually get there through South America, or you can come from Australia, but you usually have to go through Drake's Passage to actually get onto the peninsula. And the peninsula is where most people visit. Thank you very much. Um, can we show this? I'm going to show you this video. Yeah, up. Oh, you have to be. We have to go back, Heather. It went out of its uh, slide mode. Drake's Passage is about a two day event. It's exciting, um, but it's, um, if you don't have really good sea legs, it's uh, very challenging. <laughs> so you just have to be prepared for that. And we don't have much sound on that Drake's Passage, but that's okay. That moves you over to the peninsula from Drake's Passage. The continent is actually divided into east, west, and then you have the peninsula and you have a major mountain range going down there. Now my presentation is going to be talking about the terrestrial, the biodiversity of the area. I will talk about the terrestrial biome of the Antarctic and also the aquatic biome. Southern hemisphere, you know, it's land. It's covered with ice as compared to the Arctic, which is just ice. It's not a land mass, like a, it's not a continent like Antarctica. It shows you just the different uh, places that have control and how it's divided. Uh, nobody lives on, on Antarctica. Nobody, no nation has control over Antarctica. This shows you the division and the seas that fall within those three oceans of the Southern Ocean. And this is where I, will, I spent most of my time and what you will see photographs and I will talk about. This area, this wavy line here around the continent, just understand it's kind of indicative of where different organisms will migrate through. It gets very, very brutally cold on this side of the line and a lot of the species will not cross over into that. So it, it is indicative of the type of species that exists there. These basins are really showing you the flow of air. It's called Polyninias, where you have the, the wind pushing the ice out towards the coast in these different basins. There's the Weddell Edderly Basin, Australia Basin, and the Edmondson uh, Basin, where they, the winds from the mountains, from these huge mountains, the, they are actually 16,000 feet high that push, push the ice out. I didn't mention in this part, but it is the driest, the coldest, and the windiest continent in the world. You have temperatures dropping to 286 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's at Volstaw Station, which is over in this area here. The winds were measured at 199 miles per hour, and that's at uh, this mountain range over here, the Vincent, Vince, Vincent Massif. And the, the continent is managed by a treaty of some 30 nations, and there are 50 research stations on the continent. So it sounds like a lot, but it's a big continent, and so not really. <laughs> This is that trans-Antarctic mountain range. 
This is where the, our US Navy has a research station. Palmer Station is up here. We also have another research station there. I visited Palmer Station and some of the British stations as well. So I am going to talk about the biodiversity and the biome here in Antarctica. Biodiversity describes all the different living organisms in a single ecosystem or habitat. It includes all the numbers of species, their types, environmental aspects such as temperature, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the climate in that area. Biodiversity can be measured either globally, in a large scale, or even a very narrow scale such as a pond. A biome is a community of plants and animals having common characteristics for the environment they exist in. And that's going to be very central here because we're talking about the polar ice cap biome. And there are di distinct biological communities that are found in these regions and they're found in response to a physical climate. So you know we're talking about a very brutal, very cold, very dry climate. The rainfall, there is no rainfall, any precipitation of snow never touches ground and never melts, never. You will get very, very thirsty. You will get more thirsty here in Antarctica than you would in the Sahara Desert, believe it or not. So you can see the biomes that are listed. There's about nine, there's nine major biomes throughout the world. And we're talking about Antarctica here or Arctic or Greenland. And even Arctic has a tundra. Antarctica does not have a tundra. So within, that was the terrestrial biome. Now the aquatic biome, when we talk about Antarctica, this shows you a warm weather biome. This happens to be out here at the Channel Islands, but it all starts with the algae, the photosynthetic organisms. The organisms that are plant material, plant organisms that actually photosynthesize, which means they use sunlight to develop their energy. All other organisms feed on phytoplankton and they build up the zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton that goes up the food chain or what we call a trophic food web. This is showing you a structure. This is a terrestrial structure of a more familiar biome. You will see relationships but on a very familiar scale, but they will be related to Antarctica throughout this. Now this is showing you the phytoplankton found in Antarctica. You still have blue-green algae. You still have some of the same algae. And it comes in major, when they have very, very dense forms of the algae, especially during the summer months, it's called a bloom. And this shows you how it's a very cyclic thing from upwelling from the depths, whether it's here, whether it's in Galapagos, or whether it's in Antarctica. You have the same kind of circulation going on with, based on the currents, the types of organisms, and then you have this movement of gases. You have carbon dioxide coming into the ocean, and you have those phytoplankton utilizing, feeding on that carbon dioxide, and then releasing oxygen. One of the Biggest producers of oxygen on the planet is phytoplankton and other plants, but mainly phytoplankton. And this gives you what phytoplankton are fed on, are the zooplankton. These are small animal species. They're either the larval stage of some other, like a mollusk or a crab or an octopus. It's a larval stage or it's a very, very small organism that doesn't get any bigger. All right, and this gives you some examples of very, very small jellyfish. Uh, this is a krill. You have copepods. These are all different types. And copepods won't get very big. And they feed on that zooplankton, that phytoplankton, excuse me. These are those little tiny crabs. And some of the crabs here can get enormous, um, actually having three and four foot legs. So in that cold climate, that brutally cold climate, you actually have organisms that can grow to very huge size and also have very, very long lives, which is kind of spread. This is the basis of it all in Antarctica, is krill. It's a basis here, but it is major, th everything in Antarctica feeds on krill. This just gives you an example of all those different zooplankton species. So this is what it looks like. This is Antarctic krill. And it comes, as I said, it comes in blooms or swarms. All right. It is the basis of all the whales that live there, whether you're talking about the humpback whale, whether you're talking about the leopard seal, whether you're talking about the penguins, whether you're talking about any of the seabirds, this is the basis of the food chain. Even something as aggressive as a leopard seal, 45% of its diet is based on krill, not 
penguins, even though they're always after penguins and other seals. It's 45% of their diet is krill. So, and often people said, the water is so pristine, there's nothing in it. How can anything live here? No, there's no fish. Well, there are. <laughs> there's phytoplankton, and as you see the ice, when it starts to turn over, when these icebergs start to move or sway, you'll see this green tinge on it, or you'll see some brown stuff, and people think, oh, something's pooping on it. Well, no, it's algae and, and the krill. First, it's the, the krill here. You see they're feeding on all that brown and green color. That's algae embedded in the ice. Pretty amazing picture there. So this ice does move around, and you will see a lot of brown spots, a lot of green spots. But then we want to come to, are there fish here? Well, people didn't think there were fish here, but there are. The, these are the main fish. Is, uh, there's snailfish, and there's cod, a type of cod. The only thing is these fish, because of the water is so cold, they have evolved a mechanism that they do not have any hemoglobin, globin, hemoglobin, so their blood is not red like any other fish, all right, and they look very, very pale. And I'll give you, there's numerous worms and sea stars and that type of thing, but I will give you an example. This is what the bottom near, near a coastal area of Antarctic looks like. It's, it's certainly not barren. A lot of people thought it would just be barren. Now, it's not like out here, but there's, there's a lot of organisms going on here. And that's ice up there. That's the bottom of an iceberg. All right, so this is what your ice cod looks like. You see he's very, very pale, all right, but he doesn't have red blood, the red blood cells. And this is another example of the um, snailfish. So one of the most unique things about Antarctica, even though you know I went to see all the wildlife, that type of thing, the ice formations and the purity and the, the just the beauty of the area and its pristine, uh, pristine environment is just amazing. So we're going to move into penguins because everybody wants to know about penguins because that's where a lot of people go to Antarctica. There are actually 17 species of penguins in the world. The major ones, the iconic ones, are found in Antarctica. They're not found in the Arctic. They're only found in Antarctica. All right. Most of the sailors, when Antarctica was first discovered by Russians and later on, everybody thought penguins were birds. And then all of a sudden they saw them get on land. And they're like, well, this is, I thought penguins were fish. Excuse me. They thought penguins were fish. And then they saw them get on land. So no, it's a flightless bird. It is not a fish. It is in this order, Cephenosformes. Uh, they are all, all penguins, all 17 of them, are aquatic and fli flightless. If you came to my previous lectures, you saw the little small little guy that I told you about in Galapagos. Well, they believe that penguin millions of years ago actually swam from Antarctica to the Galapagos, and he didn't have to be as big anymore because he had plenty of food. He didn't have all the enemies. He didn't have leopard seals, so he got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until he's, he's um, native to the Galapagos now. So the actually people, this is kind of amazing. They know that penguins actually evolved from albatross about 60 million years ago. They have a stout, very stout, yet streamlined body, so they can move through the water. And if you've seen them swim, and you probably have on Nature Channels, they're amazing. They're very fast. The Gen 2 penguin is probably the fastest, can swim about 27 miles an hour. That's very fast for a bird. But they have a very short neck. Now that's, in, that's really, really important if you understand biology and evolution. If you've ever seen uh, photographs of these um, uh, natives that live in Siberia, up in the northern part of Siberia, they have developed very short, stocky bodies, and they're called furnace bodies because that maintains the heat. So look at a bird like this in this kind of brutally cold water, right, and on this brutally cold land, gets a nice, short, stocky body to maintain that heat. All right, it's pretty amazing stuff. So um, the wings are compressed to form the flippers. Uh, they have solid bones, which most people don't know. Most birds have very, very airy bones. Well, these have solid bones, and that's so they can dive. If they had the airy bones like all the other birds, they wouldn't be able to dive as deeply as they can for prey. Their legs are positioned far back in the body, so that means they can waddle around on the ice. 
Uh, their bill is shaped depending on the types of prey they eat. Uh, all different penguins have different uh, types of food that they like. Uh, this gland is the one that deals with a lot of the salt. The uropegial gland is located at the base of the tail so that they can uh, eject a lot of salt and waste. And they usually live over 20 years, so they have long lives. And they are very slow to reproduce because of the very cold water. There's a gentoo on her nest. You've probably heard of them stealing pebbles and sharing pebbles and the males giving pebbles to the females and all that, and that's, that is all true. Uh, the stealing the pebbles can get very aggressive and all this Disney stuff about how penguins are so wonderful and kind and they take care of their babies and they love each other and they mate for life. There are parts of that that are true and then there are parts of that that these can be very aggressive, very mean birds. They practice homosexuality, they beat up on each other, they steal, they kidnap each other's babies or they kill them depending on, so they're, they, they're wild animals. <laughs> And this, this happens to be what it looked like. It's very, very, um, it is a, you know, it's a dark time of year. Even when the, in the summer when the light comes out, it still can be very, very dark at times. Now this is the one we wanted to get a little sound because they are very no noisy birds. Now I just showed you Gen 2 penguins. These are chin strap penguins. And uh, it's pretty obvious why they're called chin straps. And we'll see. And it's all a territorial protect, protection thing. I'm going to move on. Can I do that? It, 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 yeah, it doesn't let me do that. <laughs> okay. All right, here's some feeding. Uh, this is a gentoo. And if you see around here, you'll see all this reddish. These are called the bushy tails also. You'll see all this reddish material, and a lot of people thought they were bleeding or there's some aggress aggression going on. That's the krill. That's the remainder of krill. As they e excrete their waste, it's all reddish. Even out here, if you see a whale poop, <laughs> and we have seen it, it's a big red <laughs> blob. So these are, these are actually pretty well-formed chicks. They're moving, moving along. Now the different penguins, they actually breed at different times. So they, in that sense, uh, the types of penguins, they don't compete with each other. Now there's your chin strap, and these have much, see, at the same time, but these are much younger chicks. See the difference? These are, these are just being born. They're all big fluffs. And the other ones are more mature. The Gen 2s are more mature. And taking a walk. I just, you have to get these, they're just classics, you know? So, and this is what it looks like, and it's a pretty amazing place. That's all I can tell you. Why does it do that? Now, th this is a, uh, no, it still is a Gen 2, sorry, wrong one. If you can see, there's two Gen 2s behind me, and that's the research vessel I was on. It is actually an ice an ice breaker, they don't really cut the ice, they don't really break the ice, they actually just move up on the ice, but they have to have specially designed hulls to be able to move through the ice, because they, they move up on the ice and then because of the weight of the, of the ship. There's only a few that are designed to go into certain areas. Now you have a lot of cruise ships go there, uh, but they will not go into certain areas because they don't have that ice capability to be able to move the ice around. But you still can get iced in pretty readily because the weather changes drastically and very, very quickly. But the ice formations are just an amazing thing to see. Now this happens to be an Adelie penguin. You see it doesn't have any white at the top, has no chin strap. This is the Adelie. These are the most successful. These are the most successful of the penguins worldwide. Um, they're having some difficulty in Antarctica, and obviously that's concerned. But you know, organisms when they move around, depending on what they want, they'll find their niche where they need to feed. And since the bird population worldwide is not doing too badly, actually it's a very successful bird population. But overall, they have dwindled um, over the last few years. 
Now this is a macaroni penguin, and he's called a macaroni penguin because of his little head. He's, it's like he's wearing one of those French or Italian hats and stuff. These guys, uh, they're actually very well distributed worldwide. They're doing very, very well worldwide. They just ha weren't doing very well when we were there when I was visiting. Uh, but you can see when I show you, these are all their populations and all their breeding populations. So I would tell you that the macaroni penguin is doing very well. Now here's your little Adeli. And you can see he's the much smaller, all black head, no white trim, and he's, he's smaller than the other ones. And the Gen 2 is the one that dives the deepest and is the fastest of the penguins. And the one, the iconic one that you all hear about, the big emperor penguin, is not found in this area. It's found much more inland. Um, you have to go on a totally different time of year to actually see the emperor penguins. And that's just another noisy population of... This really isn't giving you the taste because when you walk in there, it is ear splitting. It is literally ear splitting and I was trying to get that but obviously my our mics didn't pick it up but it is it's just like you like you want to see it and you want to experience it but you're like oh my god <laughs> will they ever stop. Now the guy who feeds on these, we're moving up that chain. We went through the phytoplankton, we went to the zooplankton, then we talked a little bit about fisheries, right? And there are fisheries. And then we got to the penguins, and they're a big source of food for this guy. <laughs> so uh, this is your leopard seal, and he is, for the Antarctica, he is Antarctic's polar bear. There are no polar bears in Antarctica. They're all up in the Arctic. And that's a major misconception because everybody says, oh, you're going to see polar bears. No, I'm not going to see polar bears. <laughs> but I will see penguins. <laughs> and I will see this guy. And this was a real treat. I happen to really like this guy, even though he really is evil. And yet he'll, he'll be on the ice, and you'll see him actually hanging out with other seals. You'll see him hanging out with penguins when he's not hungry. They are not really friendly with each other. Uh, the males, uh, the males are actually usually smaller than the females, slightly smaller. They're huge creatures. They're 12, 13 feet long. Uh, they weigh tons, um, but they're not very friendly, and we really, really don't know how they reproduce because they're so unfriendly. Nobody's been able to ever track them and find out how they mate or whatever. But they do mate, and I was very happy that I got this shot with his mouth open because. Um, I'll show you another shot. He looks like he's the gentlest giant in the world. Oh. There he is. He looks. I mean, does that look like it's gonna? It's really vicious. No. I mean, it's just like he looks so sweet. He's got this little smile. Um, just he, he's almost. He almost doesn't look like a seal. He looks like a snake. If you see him on the, you know, he's got this bigger head. Um, Pretty amazing creature. It's kind of a little pixelated there. This is not one of my slides, but shows you that they can be pretty um, mouthy. Now this shows him actually how they feed. They actually strip off the skin and the muscle of of the um, of the penguin, and they're they're very efficient. Here's another sweet expression. So they will eat, they will feed on Weddell seals, they'll feed on um, elephant seals, it would have to be a pup to feed on an elephant seal, but Weddell seals, the um, crab eater seal, which is not a, doesn't eat crab, but it's called the crab eater seal, uh, which I'll, I will get to, but they mainly feed on the penguins. They will also feed on fish. As I said earlier, 45% of their diet is krill. So they just, and there's a massive quil, krill, they'll just eat the krill. Their teeth are specially designed, so it actually acts like a sieve, like on some of the whales. You'll same, see the same kind of tooth formation in the crab eater seal, which is probably one of the most unique tooth formations, they say, in the animal kingdom. So he'll eat just about anything, including a human if he had to. But you can get a little bit of the size characteristics here. Now this is one of the guys he will eat. This is one of the cutest seals. This is a Weddell seal. This is the baby Weddell seal. They are pretty adorable. 
And this, this is just one, an iconic photograph. I thought I took this out, but this is published everywhere, so I figured you should see it. This penguin fought this guy off for a long, long time, and you really prayed for him to win, but eventually he just got exhausted and he couldn't keep doing it. So that's our group. So you can be an apex predator and eat everybody, but there's usually somebody comes along that's bigger and badder. And when the orcas come along, they're the only predator of the leopard seal. So I did not see this. I did not see any orcas here. Uh, they did not come in, but the only whales we saw were the humpback whales. And there's your little Weddell seal again. These are your crab eater seals. Very, very common uh, seal located all across the world, probably the most abundant seal in the world. Uh, here, this is a, a uh, sub Antarctic Arctic, um, crab eater seal. They're very, very successful. The only thing is because to avoid the uh, leopard seals and to avoid competition with the Weddell seal, they go very far inland. So they actually go, they, they love the cold. I mean, is it, they just go where it's colder and colder and colder because they want to avoid everybody else. They'll steal the breathing holes from the Weddell seals. The Weddell seals will steal their holes. Uh, they will go after each other in competition. But, the, you know, the, they only have seals here. They have about six or seven different species of seals. No sea lions, except for the elephant seal. Well, that's a seal. It's not a sea lion. <laughs> so here are your elephant seals. Now, what's different? We have elephant seals out here, the northern elephant seal. These are the southern elephant seals. They're huge and in charge. They are almost twice the size of our elephant seals. And you know our northern elephant seals are very, very big animals. These guys weigh up to um, 9,000 pounds. Ours weigh about 5,000, 6,000 pounds. They are about 20 feet long. Ours go about 12 feet long. So they are large and in charge. <laughs> All right, this, some statistics on the Weddell seal. If you want to look through this, they feed the, on the fish, the squid, and the krill, which are all found here. Um, whereas, where did I find their breeding, their distribution? The Weddell seal is the most southerly breeding animal on Earth. Uh, they can be found almost anywhere on the sub-Antarctic islands. So they're, they're not threatened in any way. So they are the least concern of any of the seals. And like most of the other seals and other things, it's the um, killer whales and possibly the leopard seal. Now they used to use them, the sledders used to use them for their dogs, but they no longer do that. And there he is again. And you know that the orcas and, and even the leopard seal will come in and start to break up the ice and kind of they'll team together, especially the orcas will move the ice around, they'll go under the ice, they'll do anything to break up the ice so these guys fall off or have to move. You know, they're, the orcas are, are just so intelligent and they, they do, you know, they hunt in packs. Leopard seal can't do that. He's got to do it all on his own, but he's very fast. And a little bit of uh, crab eater seals, most abundant large mammal on earth. Uh, most numerous kind of seal in the world. They don't eat crabs. I think I told you that already. Uh, I think I told you about their teeth. They do have run-ins with leopard seals. Uh, they, I told you about the breathing holes and how they have rights for the breathing holes. Um, they will fight back. They will roll over to get away. And this is the sieve-like teeth here that they have that are very, very specialized. Uh, which the um, leopard seal has a similar tooth. And this is your, your southern elephant seal, which I told you, these are small ones. These are females. I told you about how their size characteristics. Now you do have a lot of icebergs, and they're forming all the time. And they are breaking off all the time, and in the summer months you do have a, a whittling down of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. But as you lose ice on the peninsula side, and I'll show you a slide on that, you are actually gaining ice on the other sides. So people think it's all across Antarctica, but as one side of the climate or the earth gets warmer, there's another side somewhere that's getting colder. And this is one of the reasons you go there, even if you don't see an animal. This is 
and they're, they're breathtaking formations, and it's happening all the time. And then you imagine that you see this, you don't think there could possibly be life, and there's life everywhere. Formations are just, and the coloration and the purity of everything is amazing. This is one of my favorite shots. <laughs> Uh, this is showing you the mountain range and the elevation in certain areas. And this is the one where it removes the ice. It's about one to two miles thick on top. All right, it's a little bit thicker in some areas. And that shows you where these lakes are, different rivers, what's below sea level, and where the different lakes are, and the different rivers. And you know these rivers are always flowing and the ice moves across just like it's a river. Now these are the areas that are losing ice mass, you know, all through the peninsula here. And these are areas all along here that are actually gaining ice mass. And this just shows you a comparison of what happened, what is actually happening on Greenland, which is a little bit different on what happens in Antarctica as far as the ice. But when the sun hits it and when you're shallow area, you do see kind of this warming trend right now. The other thing that people are not aware of is in, within the peninsula area, they have actually discovered 71 more active volcanoes than they ever knew was under the peninsula. And they're, they're, some of them, they're very active. And we actually swam in one of the areas, which we could actually swim in the water. It was still freezing, but it warms the area enough. But you can see the steam coming off. And so uh, oftentimes that is not um, public knowledge that all these volcanoes have been discovered under Antarctica. And some of them very, very recently, the last 71. They knew there were other ones there, but they've discovered recently within the last five years, um, 71 more volcanoes. Now these are the popular petrels that are out there. These are huge birds. I'm not going to talk about the wandering albatross or the wavy albatross because I talked to you about that when I did my Galapagos talk. But these are unique birds and you can see from the nares here, right on their bill, they have this, this nair area and this is how they eliminate the salt because they usually stay at sea most of the time, not as much as the wandering albatross, but they have to get rid of that salt because that's the only thing, the only way they get water is from eating the fish. They don't drink water. There's no water. It's too dry. This is that guy in flight, and you can really see that in there. They're not usually, they're not as beautiful as the albatross, but they are unique, wonderful birds. And here's a gnarly looking one. <laughs> So, and now we have the cormorants. We move into the cormorants because we're moving up to that different trophic pathways there. Now those, those birds usually feed on fish. They stay out at sea for very long periods of time. Not as much as the albatross, but they're out there for a long time. This is the Antarctic cormorant. Very beautiful bird. Prettier than our cormorant, but you know, it's actually called a shag to some, to some people. Just pretty, pretty bird, very attractive. And you'll see that, you'll see him up with, uh, a really elegant bird. They can dive very, very deeply, uh, actually as deep or if not deeper than our birds, our cormorants. And uh, you, d you probably saw the uh, penguin in the background. They will actually nest all in the same thing. Some cool facts about them, they have short wings for a flying bird due to their need to swim. But because of this, they have the highest flight cost of any flying bird. That means it, t it takes a lot out of them to fly. Their, their name comes from meaning uh, sea raven, is a contraction of the two Latin words. Uh, they fe share features with other birds, the shag I, I mentioned already, but depending on who you ask, the relative distinction is the cormorant refers to a number of different birds. So we do have a number of different types of cormorants. Um, these secrete oil used for keeping their feathers waterproof. All right, but the oil is not sufficient enough for the cormorants, um, so they're see seen all the time, and you've seen them hanging their wings out to dry to get rid of the, the water. And they're used in fishing in many different cultures, and they're actually pellet makers, somewhat like owls, where they make the pellets and they spit them out. 
they have all the fish bones and everything in there. This guy was really upset with the other one. <laughs> now this is a, um, a sheath, sheath bill. He's beautiful in flight, he's a lovely, gorgeous little bird, only he doesn't have a pretty face. So people don't give him a lot of credit, and he's also a garbage bird. He eats all the trash and everything left over from the penguins. So he doesn't have, see his face is kind of, you know, they call him a rat pigeon. <laughs> but in flight, he's a beautiful, beautiful bird. Uh, and there, there he is as a chick, which I think is pretty cute. Now there's your little storm petrel. That's another elegant, beautiful bird. You can't, you know, the size of a bird like that, living in Antarctica and, and experiencing, I showed you Drake's Passage and that was nothing. And the winds and the, the atmosphere here is just really, brutal is the best word I can use for it. And the fact that something delicate like that can survive just is beyond me. And here's more petrels. And that's pretty calm ocean day. <laughs> So I just had to include my cool shots. Now here you see the cormorants up with, you see a series of gentoo penguins, and then there's some other penguins in the back, different species, and they're all hanging out on the same rocks. Here's your silky or your crab eater seal. And they do, they get this elegant, beautiful blonde color. They call them blondies. Um, they are beautiful. And you'll see them hanging out on the same ice flow as a leopard seal. And this is where the volcanoes, this is an area where those active volcanoes are keeping that water relatively warm so you don't see a lot of ice um, near this shoreline. Your chin strap. I gave you some, so they do live up to 20 years. All the penguins do. They're pretty long lived. They don't, um, their breeding is very, takes a long time for them to breed. Um, and they, they live a long time and they don't have a lot of chicks, maybe two. Now there are dolphins and whales in the area. I'm not gonna get into it. There's only about three species of dolphins that are native to that area that stay there and they're the hourglass dolphin, dusky and peels dolphin. They are not found here. Humpbacks are the most common whales we found up there. I did not see a minke, but the minke is very common. Uh, the, both of the whales migrate during the summer for great feasting because of all the upwelling, all the krill, all the different fisheries. <clears throat> there are herring up there during the summer months, uh, but they move to the warmer waters so they can breed and mate. Minky, say, fin, and blue whales and orcas are all found here as well. And these are just a couple of the whale's tail, and you can see the uniqueness of the whale's tail here. Pretty great shots. And this happens to be a whaling village that was abandoned in 1969 based on an earthquake that occurred here. It was still active during that time. Can you still hear me okay, Chip? Yeah. Uh, people were very, you know, and then whaling was going out of business back in the 70s and that type of thing. So this was abandoned in like the 69 era. But you can still see these were all tanks where all the whale oil was stored. And had it not been for you know discoveries and of petroleum and that type of thing, we were still using uh, whale oil for lamps and that type of thing, and for heating in some places, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. If you think it's not that long ago, and then there are plants here. As I talked about going back to the fact we were talking about biomes and species diversity, these lichens and moss are the only plant species that really live here. However, there are some problems with invasive species. I think I told you I'm gonna talk about biodiversity. All right, organisms do feed on this, and some, especially some of the birds, and that's what keeps as part of, this is kind of the phytoplankton to the terrestrial biome. And then you see all this different coloration in the sandstone formations that form the mountains of Antarctica, and all that is all nutrient-rich minerals that drop into the ocean, and then all the organisms utilize those minerals, that zinc, the chromium, all that coming out of that metallic rock. Um, it's very, very important because we 
You know, you have to take your minerals just like you need your vitamins. People forget about the mineral part of everything, and that all comes from rock. Me and my penguins. <laughs> So we did do a lot of going onshore, and we did a lot of hiking and trekking. However, they're very, very safety-minded, depending on, very rarely can you actually go ashore in Antarctica. And if you can, you're usually on an expedition. And they have, they have real experts, ice experts, that go out, and they traverse the area before you go up to it. And they check for crevasses and you know, separations in ice, and they lay out a trail. And it's very, very significant that you stay on these trails because it can be very, very dangerous. Very exciting also. <laughs> there you go. See Gen 2, the bushy tail. And major threats to biodiversity here, this is just showing you a terrestrial one here uh, for California is your mountain lion. But there are threats to biodiversity in Antarctica. Most people don't understand that, but there are. Not similar and not nearly as great as here because it's so inaccessible, which is one of the great things about the Channel Islands. It's not as accessible as LA or this area. But you do have problems. You do have um, <coughs> problems with different species. And not so much now with, with um, the different species competition, but we do have uh, pollution, even in Antarctica. It was kind of hard for me to look this up because it really bothered me to find that they have found PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, they have found DDT, and not mercury, I looked for mercury, but they have found organochlorinated uh, hydrocarbons. And this is how it works. All right, you have it affects the phytoplankton. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. It moves into the fisheries. It's called biomagnification. Bigger fish eat the smaller fish. And then the birds eat the fish. And then you have contaminated fish eggs. Especially with DDT, it weakens the fish eggs. Uh, PCBs is something that stores in the fat tissue. All right. So that's the bio, biological magnification. We don't have oil spills here because they're very, very serious about it. They actually, if you're going to go on land in Antarctica, they vacuum everything you own. Your clothing, everything gets back. They don't allow you to take backpacks. You don't, are not allowed to take food. Your boots have to be cleaned. Your boots are vacuumed. Your little camera sacks, you take your camera out. Your camera gets cleaned. Your camera bag gets vacuumed out. They're very, very concerned. And yet they have found um, as far as invasive species, they have found a little midge that has gotten there that is starting to feed on some of the, the lichens and the moss. It's very bad. It came out, it's a problem on one of the islands. It's not, it's more, it's closer towards uh, Australia. But that's not a good thing. It's, you know, and as pristine an area as this is, it's kind of, it's hard to believe that there could be uh, invasive species. But then the last one that usually is man's, man's effects. You know, and we're the, I'm not going to get into the greenhouse gases or anything, but <clears throat> it, it is getting warmer to some extent. But as I said, in some places it's getting warmer on the peninsula. On the other side, it's actually getting colder. You're getting more, more ice on the other side in some places, all right? But then they also discovered 71 more volcanoes <laughs> that nobody ever told you about, all right? Is the weather more extreme? Who knows? Depending on, you know, that's, humans are judging in their life expectancy of 70, 80 years, they might go to Antarctica. I don't think they'd go that long. But you're talking about billions of years. The Earth is 4.65 billion years old. So wildlife will be affected, but wildlife is very capable of moving. Like I told you, the Delhi penguin moves, all right? The different organisms move. Um, the whales migrate when it gets too cold. Um, and all the evidence is not in because this chart only goes back so far and then you see this and everybody goes, oh, you know. But if you go back and back and back and back, millions of years, you get into the uh, Melovokian cycles where it just shows the different cycles and then you get into this middle, medieval warming period where carbon dioxide was higher than it is that, that, that's even approaching today. So who knows? We just don't know. But it's something to watch. And, Anything we can do to maintain and protect the planet is something we should all be concerned about because Antarctica is a very, very significant place to have in existence. I'm not sure it should be the most visited place in the world because it needs, more, it needs protection. 
So I can open it up to questions, and that's it. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just how big is the continent of Antarctica in miles? You're kidding. <laughs> wow. It sieves through that tooth. It's got like a sieve kind of effect. So it's, it keeps all the krill and pushes all the water back out. Almost like baleen in a baleen whale. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually haven't seen the actual tooth. So just. A, yes, anything else? You're all going to go, right? <laughs> Everybody's going to go. Thank you, Kathleen, very much. I look forward to hearing about your next trip. Okay. All right? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here.